Hey everyone, um, it's Parker and Pete Blatchford, um, and welcome to What Do You Know? And we're focused, um, we're almost through Women's History Month, um, but um, we're gonna come with one more program, or one program focused on the women of Chicago theater. Um, and uh, Pete, who are we gonna talk about today? Oh, we're really only going to scratch the surface in terms of the women who actually, you know, made an impact in Chicago. But I think uh, along the way, you know, we'll we'll hit um, enough of them who have impacts on future generations. People like Neva Boyd and Viola Spolin, and of course Jane Addams and uh, Laura Dainty Pelham and you know Shor uh, Charlotte Corpenny. People like that uh, who. Uh, were essential in sort of helping theater in Chicago evolve and subsequently theater all over the world. Okay, so where does it start? Um, and we'll have a slideshow going up and we do see comments. By the way, this is on Facebook um, in both Act Your Page and my page. <clears throat> and it's also on the YouTube channel. Um, and we will see comments up in our chat screen if you have questions um, or thoughts or some experiences about Chicago women in history um, in theater history. So where does it begin? Um, women's involvement in theater in Chicago. And I know we can't really pinpoint to the first moment, but we start with Jane Addams. Yeah. I think that's as good a place to start as any, as any, because she, she saw theater as a way of helping promote her own social agenda for a whole house. You know, the works of uh, Bernard Shaw and Pinero and, and Galsworthy and people like that uh, spoke to the issues she was confronting. So a lot of the plays that um, the whole house players presented in its original incarnation under the direction of Laura Dainty Pelham, yeah, um, they they spoke, uh, those plays spoke to Jane's, uh, Jane's overall um, vision for social equity, um, the rights of the working man, uh, issues like that that were uh, that were very important to her. Mm -hmm. So many people might be familiar with Hull House and Jane, Jane Addams and the social work there, um, which is absolutely significant. Um, most people have heard of her, but one of the one of the things when we've talked about in the past about the WPA, the um, the, the Big White Fog, um, places where you might not have expected theater, um, here it comes. And so why did Adams care about theater? Well, I think it was a way of reaching, for her message to reach a larger and wider audience. And they certainly did do that, not only nationally, because the group toured, but also internationally, they had a few overseas um, performances as well, and they were highly regarded. The the uh, the, um, the cast, the company, was comprised of Hull House members uh, who had gone through the uh, the program, and during the day they were workaday folk and held regular jobs, and then in the evening they would come to rehearsals for uh, whatever play they were in production for. And they retained a high degree of respectability uh, for not only the whole house, but for theater in general. Uh, so I think uh, it, um, it, was, it, it was a way for whole house to say, you know, uh, a group of social workers, mm. we are artists. We are carpenters. We are, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and the, and there was and the, the it began as this one agenda with um, the idea that um, help spread the social agenda that Adams wanted to portray, mm -hmm. but it had a larger impact, and it weaves. It's a through line to the history of Chicago theater. Mm. Okay, that's an interesting comment. Um, 
and I we're having a little bit of tech issues with the breaking up, but um, it is snowing here in northern Wisconsin, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> a little bit of wind. Yeah, almost April. Um, so uh, just hang in there with us, please. And if you if you miss some of the show, um, you can catch the catch it in its entirety on the YouTube channel, which is linked in the Facebook page. Um, so the Fish Liquor Actor Page YouTube channel. And just uh, just for reference, we're talking to Pete Blatchford, author of Wicked, uh, Immoral, and Utterly Bad, the his Chica illustrated history of Chicago theater. And we focused on the women of Chicago theater history, beginning with Jane Addams, who was not only a social reformer known for a whole house, but also brings in something called little theater. And you say that it is really the beginning of the through line for Chicago theater. That was one of my discoveries in researching this book. I discovered that, you know, okay, it was great. You know, the whole house players certainly had their impact and they were certainly well received. Uh, but as time went on, um, you, 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 you see this evolution, this sort of continuance, if you will, because after the uh, heyday of the whole house players, which point in the late 30s and in the mid 30s, uh, and then kind of began to fade out uh, during the uh, during the 40s. In between, there were these little pop-ups, if you will. Uh, for example, uh, we talked about uh, the Federal Theater Project. Mm -hmm. And under the Works Progress Administration, Hull House received a funding. And under that, uh, that funding for, the, for uh, the games, the theater games of Neva Boyd were developed mm -hmm. in the, in the, uh, mid, in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. um, her idea was to free the child or the adult, because these games were aimed at children and adult, to stimulate creativity and, and get the maximum, the best out of a performer. Mm. Even if you were just playing, even if you were just, you, you weren't, you know, going to be an actor per se. One of her students was uh, Viola Spolin. Mm. Took the games that she had learned from Neva Boyd and she expanded on them. She, her entire uh, career was based on a book that she put together, she edited called Improvisation for the Theater. Um, that in turn was the, ba the the basis for modern day improvisation. So we mm -hmm. get the mm -hmm. players, then moving on to Second City, mm -hmm. moving on to Saturday Night Live and the myriad of other groups that came up before then and during that time. Mm -hmm. One of um, Viola Spolin's protégés was Joe Forsberg, who mm -hmm. won the games and through her connections, um, developed a relationship with Second City, and she created the Players Workshop of the Second City. I'm mm -hmm. proud to say that I was a student of hers, and so many more. Uh, she, Joe, um, while she, you know, believed, you know, that it was a great tool to have for an actor, she also saw that its potential to reach non-actors. Some mm -hmm. became actors, perhaps most famously people like Tim Kazarinsky, who uh, went through her program and subsequently Second City after starting out as a ad, ad executive mm -hmm. at, at, a, at a downtown firm. Um, so, it, it, so this is what I'm talking about. And then from there, we have a sort of a revitalization of the uh, whole house theater in the off loop area. This was uh, um, at the time it was thought that um, again, using theater as sort of a platform to address uh, social issues. In Adam's lead, you had Bob Sickinger this theater that was on Broadway and Belmont. Um, mm -hmm. 
Jane Addams uh, Center. Uh, that in turn led to creating an audience for off-loop theater. Prior to that time, an audience's idea of going to the theater in Chicago was limited to downtown. You would go to the Goodman, or you might go to a touring show at the Schubert or one of the other commercial houses downtown. You didn't go to theater outside of a loop. That's nuts. <laughs> but through his dynamic productions, mm -hmm. Bob Sickinger and Whole House created an audience. They built an audience for off-loop productions. Without that, would we have had an off-loop theater movement? It's doubtful. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to credit Second City with that. They, they were, in 1959, they were among the very first off-loop uh, theater companies mm -hmm. to produce. It was a little safer because um, you know, it wasn't that far downtown, but it was still, Old Town was still a pretty shady neighborhood in the late, in the late 50s, early 60s. So this is what I'm talking about, the through line from way back when until the 1970s. If you look at it, you connect the dots as you go along. And bottom. Mm -hmm. So Adams, um, you're basically what you're saying is um, she's making theater popular in all parts of the city. One of the things I read is that she would use um, non-actors um, and... Um, so, and you just mentioned this about like Joe Forsberg. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of uh, uh, theatricalizing the city and making everybody kind of your, uh, uh, what would be a better word than apostle, but you're basically bringing theater everyone and then also people are invested in theater. Exactly. Um, so we go back to Adam's just for a minute, because I, I do want to mention something that was fascinating to, to read about. Um, it's not just that Hall House is has this, well, it's credited with having this first little theater, mm -hmm. first little theater. Yeah. Um, but actually, one of the things I discovered and um, was quite a few firsts. Um, so first public playground, yes, you know, kindergarten, um, college courses, um, people would learn English or sculpting or painting there, um, free, right? Um, it wasn't, it was, wasn't cost prohibitive. It wasn't, oh, I want to go to the art Institute, I, but I don't have the money, right? Right. Uh, for a big university. So she... I think probably saw theater as another thing that should be accessible. First domestic violence court advocacy, first foster care program. I mean, Adams really in many, many, many ways was a pioneer. And with it comes the, the theater piece. Um, how does that, how does that uh, position itself or juxtaposition itself against other theater of the time, what would it have been unusual? Or, I mean, you know, was it, were there other places starting to pop up like Hall House Players or? You know, I don't know the entire history of uh, the Settlement House program. Um, I'm most familiar with, with, with Hull House. And even that I would admit that I, I'm, no expert, but I think the work that the whole house players did in and above, you know, presenting, um, you know, great productions, they created just as the sixties era whole house created an audience for non-traditional spaces outside of downtown Chicago, the whole house players created audiences for European plays, which had not really been done before outside of, you know, maybe New York. Um, they, you know, 
theater in general, you know, at the time still kind of had a dubious reputation. Um, people were more inclined to go see the latest star vehicle with like Sarah, um, you know, some, uh, some vaudeville production or some great extravag musical extravaganza, like Mr. Bluebird beard that we talked about, mm -hmm. talked about, uh, the Iroquois theater fire. That was probably more in line. They weren't necessarily interested in um, plays that addressed social issues that spoke that were designed to kind of speak to them and maybe wake them up as it were. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't it at all. They were there to be entertained, you know, to be thrilled, to be dazzled. Mm -hmm. um, in that way, present by presenting these plays, Jane Addams, Laura Dainty Pelham and the Hull House players broke new ground. Um, they created new audiences. Um, and expanded the repertoire of what the playhouses could offer or, exactly. or maybe should offer. Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, with, with so you've, you've touched on some of the, the others, um, women of Chicago, and there's so many, um, but um, who have we not talked about? Who do we need to talk about? Well, I think uh, as long as we're on the topic of little theater, um, Maurice Brown and his wife, at, um, Ellen Van Volkensburg Brown, are credited with the creation of Little Theater in America. But as Brown said himself, it was uh, Mrs. Pelham, not I, who founded the, who's the, you know, the true founder of American Little Theater. Um, now, I guess Brown does get credit for producing theater in a little theater, which is hence the name. Um, mm -hmm. He and his wife um, created things like emotional lighting to hence help emo uh, enhance the mood of a particular scene. Uh, Ellen herself was um, a, a puppeteer and she was um, dedicated like her husband to producing these European dramas that um, you know, spoke to important issues of the day. Uh, I know that you know George Bernard Shaw was a fan and had said, you know, uh, one of these things, you know, the work this man did on the fourth floor back in uh, in Chicago was, uh, was you know, was um, some of the greatest work ever done. You know, something to that effect. He was a, he was in the aftermath. Um, now, unlike the Hull House players who lasted for several years, uh, the uh, the the Chicago Little Theater movement um, was here and gone almost overnight, and that largely had to do with uh, Brown's personality um, and his sort of you know taskmaster mentality. And why can't you work nine hours you know straight? <laughs> what do you mean you have jobs to go to? <laughs> Aren't you dedicated? <laughs> um, so. But I mean, and that and that in turn sort of formed the foundation for people who, took, who came in his steps, like Kenneth Goodman, whose plays prior to the formation of the Goodman Theater, his little um, theater society, um, were also little theater type plays. He and his friend and co co author uh, Ben Hecht. Uh, who you may know, uh, worked together early on. Uh, and then before Ben Heck moved to Hollywood with his uh, partner, uh, James MacArthur. So, I mean, Charles MacArthur, excuse me. James was his son. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> so um, Ellen Brown's The Little Theater Movement is short lasting, but it does have, it's part of that through line. Mm -hmm. And it does have an effect. Um, yes. Intimate theater um, in early 20th century, um, small black, we call now black box theater, mm -hmm. it would have been an anomaly, correct? Yes. Because when we were talking about the Iroquois fire a few months ago um, and the capacity, and I'm trying to remember, was 1,400? Is that about how many were in for uh, Mr. Bluebeard that, that fatal day? That's about right. 
Yeah. So the concept of seeing theater in a seven, like um, Joe Forsberg's um, theater shop, 70 seat house, right? Right. Um, that would have been different. Very different. Very different. Yeah. And uh, again, it's, you know, the, it's presenting plays with a, with a decisive, decisive um, social commentary. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, who else do we need to talk to? Who about who? Who have we not covered yet? I know you've you've mentioned there's well quite a few people actually yet. Yeah, Ruth Page, I'm thinking mainly, but who else should we talk about in that through line? Well, Certainly I think Jane Adams. I think I think within that through line, you have to. I mean, we talked about Neva Boyd. We talked about the oldest mm-hmm. woman, but see, the work that Neva Boyd was doing was also in in a line with the then emerging uh, modern or current modern day uh, children's theater movement. Now mm-hmm. children's theater largely up until that point had been largely theater, you know, very slight, very sort of um, dumbed down, you know, plays for young audiences. And Boyd and people like uh, Winifred Ward out of Northwestern University and one of her uh, protégés, Charlotte Corpenny, said, we need to have a shared experience between the audience and the performer. And we need to present stories that are familiar, yes. So a lot of the scripts that Charlotte wrote were came out of classic stories, um, classic fairy stories that were familiar but they were presented in a way that both young and old audiences could relate to. They wouldn't be bored. They wouldn't say, oh, this is stupid. I'm getting out of here. Um, And this was, believe it or not, a revolutionary way of thinking about uh, theater for for youngsters, so. Mm -hmm. Children's theater, we take it for granted now. It's just expected and you know, um, a theater has a children's theater program, but it what didn't always exist. Adams certainly um, believed in the education of children as well as their whether it was playground time or their safety. So she was doing she was doing this as well. She certainly was. There, there certainly were plays um, for young audiences by young actors um, right. during Jane Adams' day. Yes. So Ward and Chirpening, they kind of, they elevate the status, right? They exalt the status and the possibilities of children's theater. Um, And it certainly has exponential effects on um, theater to come. Um, Not only theater to be created, but also theater to be absorbed by audiences who grew up with um, in children's theater programs. Uh, okay, so um, so a Northwest to Northwestern. Um, yes, that was great program, great theater program there. Mm-hmm. Um, and what else? Who else do we need to talk about? Well, we had um, uh, going back a little bit, backtracking a bit uh, to the little theater movement. We had uh, Mary Aldis, who was a wealthy um, theater up in. Um, Lake Forest, Illinois, and she had her little, um, she had her own little group, her own little company called the Aldous Playhouse. And she was producing plays up there with her, uh, with her, with her husband. And uh, it was not, mm, it was not Maurice Brown level of uh, production uh, or in time in terms of the kinds of plays, but it was, Little theater presenting these, um, you know, European dramas um, or or not as produced dramas to another audience and is uh, Mm -hmm. to feed that audience for the little theater movement and for European plays. You know, subsequently, after the uh, little theater, the little theater movement folded, if you want, for want of a better word. you had productions of Doll's House. You had productions, you know, 
a, like the, a, a Bernard Shaw, you know, um, arms and, you know, arms and the man, you know, touring the country, you know, they were getting houses and you, I, in the, you wouldn't have gotten that without the work of, uh, without the work of Aldous and, and Brown and, and uh, Ellen von Volkenberg. So mm -hmm. there you go. Um, of course, and then, we, and then we have the slide up for Catherine Dunn. Dunham said, why don't we talk about her? It kind of takes us back a little bit to the Federal Theater Project, right? Yes. Um, yes. The um, uh, Negro unit. Um, mm -hmm. But her chore choreography is significant. Why? Well, she rather, she, she was very interested in presenting folk stories, particularly African-American or um, Caribbean, you know, type stories in dance and creating a story to go along with them. You know, mm -hmm. dance up until that time had largely been um, sort of a very formal kind of an affair, like, you know, ballet or uh, something more, you know, folk dances and that sort of thing. Um, Dunham said, you know, I'm, you know, I not only want to do these, you know, traditional types of dances, with and I want to do these incredible costumes, but I want to tell the story of the dance, and I want there to be a narrative that goes along with it. So I want to create much like a ballet, where there's often a story. I want to do the same thing to these folk stories, these folk dances. And she didn't, and she it was more. She's one of those people who like say, "Why can't that be done?" She asked why, and. No one could give her a good reason why not. So she went ahead and did it. And she not only did those, but she also went on, she did choreography for other productions um, that um, came out of Chicago. I think probably the most notable would be uh, the uh, Swing Mikado, later, mm -hmm. later, later, mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. later rechristened the Hot Mikado mm -hmm. for its New York run. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, but she was very much involved in that. Mm -hmm. So many different women, um, theater, improv, dance, uh, classes, social reformation, European plays, um, pushing boundaries, pushing edges. If we've, I know we've forgotten plenty of women, but anybody else we need should mention tonight. Um, well, I guess, I guess maybe in closing, uh, we could mention, um, you know, Mabel Altair, who was, um, the grandmother to Bill Polinsi. Now she's, um, she's what you might call one of the women who worked in the wings, but she, her accounting savvy enabled Bill Polinsi to build the candlelight, candlelight playhouse. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think a lot of women who maybe were out of the limelight performed roles much like Mabel's in making things happen, you know, from behind the scenes, if you will. Uh, they provided the funding, they provided, uh, you know, maybe costumes, uh, they provided, you know, advertising, that sort of thing. You know, but without, without someone to provide, you know, financing, what is a theater without money? I mean, how do you get off the ground? And without someone who shares your vision of the theater, um, it sees its potential. How does theater happen? Well, quite frankly, it doesn't. Unless you have someone like Mrs. Altier. Now, granted, she was married to her husband, who was a kind of a promoter and you know backer of of theater in the past. So you know she certainly. And she, but she, but she shared her husband's and her grandson's enthusiasm. So, yes, people. I think the hist history of Chicago theater um, is littered with brilliant women like that. Well, let's talk about before we close about Ruth Page. Oh, of course, of course. So now, we, we, I mean, people may be familiar with the Ruth Page Center for the Arts, um, and I've seen. Mm -hmm. Actions there mm -hmm. of the woman for whom it is named. 
Mm -hmm. um, what do we know? The dancer, choreographer, innovator. Um, why? How does she push the edges? Whereas Catherine Dunham, who worked with Ruth Page, um, delved into traditional folk stories from all various backgrounds, Ruth Page <coughs> pioneered the avant-garde into um, one of her most famous would be Frankie and Johnny, a familiar folk ballad. But she, but she took that familiar material and she created these avant-garde dances that helped to bring out elements from the actual story in visual and exciting ways that audience hadn't seen before. And it was a way to, again, much like Catherine Dunham, to tell the complete story through this dance. That was the one thing that she and Dunham shared, the storytelling of dance. Um, and as I say, the big difference was that <clears throat> Paige pursued the more avant-garde and abstract um, via, uh, the vehicles cost through costumes and design and through movement. Uh, whereas Dunham was more steeped in traditional dance techniques, choreography, if you will. Sorry, I've lost your audio. I'm not hearing you. That's on me. Um, I, I I went mime for a second. Um, <laughs> Marcel, Marcel. Um, we, uh, we've been talking to author Pete Blatchford. The book is entitled Wicked Immoral and Utterly Bad, an Illustrated History of Chicago Theater. We've done other installments on uh, sections of the book, including the Iroquois Fire and uh, The Big White Fog. It's a fascinating book. Um, it is available at Goodman Theatre Bookshop, um, as well as on Amazon. Um, and we will, um, in a second, I'll also give you a link to the, um, to the final page. But any other words uh, as we finish our discussion, really all too brief on the significant, um, you know, or just, uh, you know, Barbara Gaines is leaving um, uh, Chicago Shakespeare Theater after 36 years, um, you know, starting it as a as a, uh, a venue for classes at the Red Lion Pub. So there's another big part of women in uh, Chicago history, um, Barbara Gaines' influence um, on Chicago theater and Shakespeare, Shakespearean productions. Mm -hmm. But um, what, 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 how, um, what would you tell people um, in kind of in, in brief, like what, what, where would we be without the women um, really history makers of Chicago theater and improv and dance? It would be a poorer place. It, um, and women of today, like Mary Zimmerman, they have something to point to. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can they can look to their to the sisters who came before mm -hmm. and they say and be inspired by what uh, they've done. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and, and then, and, I, and I'm sure that people like Barbara Gaines and Mary Zimmer will will continue to influence and inspire future generations and current generations of women theater artists. So I think that's the legacy. Mm -hmm. As well, as it be. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we we we've talked about um, roughly about ten of the women. They are featured in Pete's book. The um, the website is wickedchicagostage.com. Mm -hmm. 
for more information, for interviews, um, to access the book. Uh, it's, um, I would echo what Pete said in terms of the world of theater in general. Without Chicago theater history, it's a much poorer place because it, as we've discovered in past discussions, features prominently um, in improv, um, as well as the little theater movement, uh, storefront theaters, um, accessibility. I'd say there's even, even a kind of a, um, and accessibility is a huge tip of the hat to Chicago theater. Well, and I think women today, we know from just a few years ago, were the leaders of the Me Too movement after certain unsavory incidences that occurred, sadly, here in Chicago. They're trying to change the way women, uh, well, they're, try they're trying to create more equality for both men and women, but mostly women, so that they don't have to go through the abuse, let's call it, uh, by some theater directors and artists and companies. Um, and they're trying to make it, the theater a good experience for the, the sisters that come from come behind them. Uh, and they're also, you know, pioneering things, you know, like so people feel free to use, you know, words that um, that describe them more perfect. You know, are you a he, him, she, he? Are you a they? And make that okay. Um, so they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying to do things like, you know, make it more more friendly theater has usually been always a welcoming people place for creative types and i think women today and their male allies are trying to build on that and trying to make it more accessible and more friendly so that we can do the work that we like to do um, so we can continue to create in a non-threatening uh, atmosphere the um this the predator yes the me too predecessor or the not in my house that broke when i was at the kenyan playwrights festival mm -hmm. and it the the story from chicago reader um mm -hmm. and uh the women who were affected and um it it was all people were talking about no matter where they were from there were one or two other people from chicago area like me um and so it had a significant impact, a catalyzing and congealing effect among women um, act actresses, mm -hmm. um, but creatives in terms of we're not going to allow, you know, this just cannot go on. It cannot, it cannot be that the price of being in theater is this. Um, pain, suffering, you know, because you're working late on you know, or the show closes early or whatever, but not this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great mention. Um, that's um, uh, a, a great uh, thing to include. So from Jane Adams to Barbara Harris and Mary Zimmerman and all in between, um, we hope you've enjoyed this um, and really hope it's kind of whetted your appetite to want to know more about uh, theater history in Chicago and um, women's involvements as we're finishing up Women's History Month. Um, but um, this history is always relevant. Um, and so the next time you go to a Second City production or a small uh, storefront production or um, see a play by George Bernard Shaw, uh, you might think about the through line Pete mentions. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And, you know, if you have questions, um, they should contact you, right, Pete? They absolutely, sir. They absolutely should and I'll be happy to answer them as, as best I can. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. All right. Take care, everyone.